This video is part one of a two-part introduction to photosynthesis for AP Biology. When we're looking at the question of metabolism or how living things obtain or use energy, there are two primary ways living things accomplish this goal. One way is many organisms are what we call autotrophs. These are organisms who obtain the high energy carbon-based molecules used for metabolism by building it on their own. In the example you can see here with the plant, plants are able to use sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water through the process of photosynthesis to synthesize glucose and they release oxygen as a waste product. Another way this is accomplished is through what we call being heterotrophic or being a heterotroph. These are organisms that are unable to synthesize their own carbon-based energy molecules, so instead they obtain those organic compounds from their environments, take in oxygen, and use that to break down the sugar to re then release carbon dioxide and water as waste products. A question I want us to start off with is, when life started on Earth, which type of metabolism likely came first? Was it the autotrophs or the heterotrophs? And what evidence could potentially give us an answer to this question? Well, if you look at the history of Earth, we're actually able to document what gases were present in Earth's atmosphere, and this gives us a lot of insight into that question. If you look all the way back to 4.5 billion years ago, you'll see there really wasn't any oxygen on Earth, not much methane, but there was a significant amount of carbon dioxide. As we get closer to today, all of a sudden there's an increase in methane and a decrease in CO2, and then when you get a little past 2.5 billion years ago, you have a sudden spike in oxygen. Considering that oxygen is necessary for the heterotrophic pathway, but only CO2 is for autotrophs, this strongly suggests that autotrophic metabolisms, things like photosynthesis, is how the first living organisms on Earth primarily obtained the carbon energy-rich molecules you need to produce the energy required to survive. So let's look at how they're both connected. Heterotrophs, they are ingesting their organic molecules they're taking that glucose and they're oxidizing it with oxygen. They're breaking it down to form ATP for energy. As waste products, they're releasing CO2 and water. And so here you can see that oxidation. Glucose is broken down again and again and released as CO2 and loses electrons as a result. With an autotroph, something like photosynthesis, we have the exact opposite. Instead of releasing CO2 and water, we're taking them in. And instead of entering with glucose and oxygen, we're releasing them. With an autotroph, instead of doing an oxidation to break down glucose, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to reduce CO2, build it up into a complex carbohydrate sugar. So these two reactions are absolutely complementary. They're accomplishing the same thing, just in different directions. Heterotrophs are doing an oxidation, an exergonic process. Autotrophs are doing a reduction, an endergonic process. So when we go over photosynthesis, from a global standpoint, photosynthesis is just the story of how solar energy is converted into chemical energy within the plant, which can then progress through the food webs and food chains that make up the ecosystems we find on Earth. To be a little more specific, this is the story of how solar energy is converted into energy-rich carbon molecules such as glucose. Glucose will be the example that we use through our unit in photosynthesis. So we want to know, what does it mean to be a plant? Well, plants need to be able to collect light. Again, they're converting solar energy into chemical energy. They need to be able to somehow store this light energy and use it and move it around from one part of the plant to another to accomplish the task of building not only glucose, but the building block atoms that make up all the macromolecules that make up plants. Plants need a source of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. They need these organic molecules in order to grow. They need to be able to make carbs, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. So here's our equation for photosynthesis. We're gonna analyze each part, and I wanna start with looking at light. What is light and what is its role in photosynthesis? Light is currently defined as being a wavicle, meaning light, in terms of a little electromagnetic radiation is both a particle and a wave at the same time. It all depends on if you observe it. There's a lot of great physics behind this. I'll leave it to the physics teachers to explain that as they can do it more poetically than I can. Here I'm showing you different wavelengths of visible light. Here you can see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Do you notice any patterns or trends between these colors? Hopefully you notice that red, orange, and yellow, they have a lower frequency and a very high wavelength. That's less energy in those light waves compared to greens, blues, and violets. 
Keep in mind when we're talking about light, visible light, what you can see is a microscopic portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. When we look at light energy, you have waves as large as radio, microwave, infrared, and with such high frequency and energy as ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma ray. We are going to stay when looking at photosynthesis within the visible light spectrum, as that is where most plants operate. Keep in mind that's all you can see as well. Your eye can only pick up visible light. We have such a small window into the large range of light energy available in our universe. When we think about light, know that white light contains all other light frequencies. Roy G. Bibb, it has red, orange, yellow, green. So knowing that, if white light shines on a banana, why is the banana yellow? Well, yellow light from the white light bounces off of the banana, meaning it is reflected, and that is the wavelength that hits your eye. But all other wavelengths are present in white light, so where did they go? They're absorbed by the banana, meaning that solar energy, that light energy has been absorbed and converted to a different state on the banana's surface. Since it's absorbed, you don't see it because your eyes don't see objects, they only see the light that bounces off of them. So when we think about how plants absorb light, plants are going to be able to do this using a molecule called a pigment. Pigments are chemicals that just absorb or reflect different frequencies of light. For example, if you look at these three leaves down here, what color does the pigment keratin reflect? Well, since you can see yellow, you can only see what's reflected, I know that yellow is being reflected from keratin. What about this leaf with chlorophyll? What color does the pigment chlorophyll absorb? Well, since I can see green, that means all other frequencies of light are being absorbed. So the chlorophyll is absorbing reds and blues and violets. When we think about the pigments of photosynthesis, oftentimes they're referred to as being a photosystem. A photosystem is nothing more than a collection of pigments in a portion of the plant that are utilized in order to obtain solar energy and do the process of photosynthesis. So you'll see the term photosystem quite frequently. If we want to determine what frequencies of light a plant is absorbing, we can generate an image like this, which is known as an absorbance spectra. An absorbance spectra is just demonstrating how much energy is absorbed by a pigment based on its wavelength. So looking at this graph here, it's showing me that this chlorophyll here is absorbing a lot of blue and green and a little bit of orange, and this chlorophyll is absorbing a lot of orange and red and a lot of violet and blue. The higher the peak, the more of that wavelength that's being absorbed. In photosynthesis, there are two photosystems we want to be concerned with. One is referred to as being photosystem 2. Photosystem 2 contains mostly chlorophyll A, and so oftentimes we refer to it as being P680. Why? Because chlorophyll A absorbs a lot of frequency around 680 nanometers. The other photosystem you're going to see is called photosystem 1. This contains a large concentration of chlorophyll B, so it's often referred to as P700 because it absorbs the most around the 700 range. So looking at this absorbance spectra, could you determine what color this plant is and explain how you know that? Well, when I look at it, I see that a lot of blues and violets and reds and oranges are absorbed because the peaks are showing how much is being absorbed of each wavelength. But if I look here at the greens and yellows, not much absorbance. And if light's not being absorbed, it's being reflected. So I would say that this plant is greenish yellow. How do I know that? Because green and yellow are not being absorbed. All other color frequencies are. So that takes care of light. Let's look at how the reactants and products move across a plant in photosynthesis. It's helpful to know the structure of a plant itself. To obtain the raw materials needed for photosynthesis, a plant, first and foremost, needs sunlight. Sunlight is going to be absorbed on the leaves on a plant. The best analogy I can think of for leaves is a solar panel, because in the true meaning of a solar panel, plants are using their leaves to absorb solar energy and convert it into another form. For CO2, plants are going to need to be able to exchange gas both directions. They're going to be able to take CO2 in and push it out when they do cellular respiration because plants also do cellular respiration. They're going to do that at the leaves at a structure called a stomate. For water, plants don't get water from their leaves or their stems. They actually get them from the roots. And water is not the only thing they obtain from the roots. They also obtain nutrients from the soil that they need for building macromolecules. Nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and iron. 
Here's one of those stomates I mentioned to you. These are small openings on the surface of a leaf and they have two cells lining them called guard cells that are able to open and close. These are used for transpiration. Reminder, water goes up the roots through the stems and then evaporates out of the leaf. That happens at the stomate. And this is where all gas exchange happens. With photosynthesis, plants take CO2 in and release oxygen. And when plants do cellular respiration, they take in oxygen and release CO2. Photosynthesis is going to occur at the chloroplast. A reminder that the chloroplast is that organelle unique to plant cells that is capable of doing photosynthesis. Here in this diagram, you can see a chloroplast. It has a somewhat translucent membrane, which makes sense. We want the plant to be able to absorb light. And you can see the different structures within. It is here found primarily in the leaves, but not only in the leaves, where light and CO2 will be able to enter the thylakoid and energy and sugar will exit. To get more specific about the anatomy of a chloroplast, within the chloroplast you can see these small stacked discs. These are called thylakoids. Thylakoids are where we find pigments in the plant, those molecules that absorb light energy, and this is where a reaction called the light-dependent reaction is going to occur. It's a reaction that requires light, and we'll cover it in the next Ed Puzzle. The next structure is a granum. You can see these individual thylakoids are stacked up on a, a, in a tower or a series of discs, we call that the granum. The granum is just the term for a stack of thylakoids. There is space surrounding these thylakoids in the chloroplast, and we refer to that as the stroma. This is just a jelly-like substance, and it is the site for where the Calvin cycle, also known as light independent reactions, will occur. We will cover that also in the next Ed Puzzle. So we have the thylakoid disc, granum stack, and stroma as the space within. I want to draw a couple analogies before we jump in deeper between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Notice that in cellular respiration with the chloroplast, there's a jelly-like substance called the stroma. And in cellular respiration, there was a jelly-like substance called the cytosol inside of the cell. In both of these spaces, this provides a location where chemical reactions can and do occur. Another similarity is we have thylakoids or double membrane sacs inside of our chloroplast. The mitochondria is also a double membrane sac. This is important because both are able to create concentration gradients with hydrogen ions for the synthesis of ATP with ATP synthase. In the case of the thylakoid, we're building a concentration gradient inside the thylakoid and it's diffusing out into the stroma with the mitochondria that is reversed. We're pumping hydrogen concentrations up into that inner membrane space and then diffusing them back into the matrix. Similar structures here and similar functions. So let's just review where everything's coming in and out of a plant. For light, that's going to be, of course, shining on and hitting the leaf. But what molecule specifically is absorbing that light energy? Pigments. You have pigments like chlorophyll A or chlorophyll B. You can have carotenoids. There are a huge variety of pigments. For carbon dioxide, that's going to be coming in into what structure in the leaf? The stoma. Specifically, it's going to go to the leaf, and that's where all gas exchange is going to occur. Where's the water going to enter the plant? Through the roots, and it'll go out through transpiration. How about the oxygen? All gas exchange happens at the leaf. CO2 in and out, oxygen in and out. And for the sugar, that's going to remain in the plant. The whole goal of photosynthesis is to synthesize sugars the plant's going to be able to use and break down through cellular respiration. Again, plants do both photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Photosynthesis makes the sugar, cellular respiration breaks it down to produce ATP. So how do we figure this out in terms of what atoms are entering and exiting the plant and how they're combining or changing during photosynthesis? I mean, if you look at this diagram here, we know that the carbon from CO2 goes to glucose, the oxygen goes to both the glucose and water, and we know that the oxygen that plants release, sorry, the water that plants take in, becomes the oxygen that plants release. How did scientists determine this? Well, clever use of isotopes. Isotopes are atoms with more or less neutrons and protons, and we're able to experimentally track where they go. So in a classic experiment to determine this data, scientists used a radioactive isotope, heavy oxygen 18, and they placed it onto the water molecule. When they provided this heavy oxygen water to a plant, they were able to record it in the oxygen that exited the plant, proving that it's the oxygen from water that's being released, not the oxygen from CO2. Because when they did the same experiment but made CO2 with heavy oxygen, 
they ended up recording it in the glucose that the plant synthesized. I'm showing you this just as a, how to mention to you how we can use isotopes to prove what atoms are going in and out of metabolic pathways. This is very important information when trying to understand the structure of something as complicated as, say, glycolysis or photosynthesis. So now you've had an introduction into the anatomy of a plant, how light is used and how it is absorbed. You know how to read that data from an absorbent spectra, and you're familiar with the reaction of photosynthesis, CO2, water and light in, sugar and oxygen out. In the next video, we'll answer the question of how do plants do this? How are plants able to convert carbon dioxide and water into sugar and oxygen? Thank you, and I'll see you next time.